Hello and welcome back to the show. My guest today is Michael Bing from the West Midlands region in England. Michael is a quantity surveyor by profession. Some people call that cost estimator as well. And he became kind of famous in the industry for doing a cost estimate for the notorious High Speed 2 project in England back in around 2017, I believe, when they did a major review, the so-called OKV review, which you will find lots of information about on the internet. Michael is an expert in cost estimating for projects, specifically rare projects, and he has quite a lot of experience and a very profound cost database for doing his work. We are talking about Uh, what went wrong with the High Speed 2 cost estimate and budget in England. We're talking about the high speed ambitions in Australia and to what extent he think things can be helped. We're also talking about competency development, which addresses a lot the problems that were seen recently in cost estimating for projects and much more. Please enjoy this episode After word from our sponsor. Hi, this is Doc Frank. Let me jump in here right now to tell you about a new training which is called High Capacity Signaling Blueprint. This is a very unique all in one training that gives you everything you need to know about high capacity signaling. The foundations where you can compare what conventional signaling is to what high capacity signaling is with all the necessary definitions. Then we look at CBTC, Communications Based Train Control, as the prime technology for high capacity signaling and how this is done. In the third part of the training, we look at varieties of the European train control system, ETCS another global train control technology and how this can be used to achieve high capacity signaling. And then at the end of the training comes an actual blueprint how to apply CBTC or ETCS to get a real high capacity outcome for your railway. It's basically three training courses in one. And as usual for my trainings, there is a study group available for joint learning with other people taking the same training. And after the training, you will get into an alumni community, which is exclusive for my training students, where you can ask questions and get them answered by myself on an ongoing basis for a guaranteed minimum of 12 months. You can sign up on my usual training platform, which is docfranktraining.podia.com slash hcsblueprint. I said it again, docfranktraining.podia.com slash hcsblueprint with HCS being the acronym for High Capacity Signaling. If it's important for you to learn about the latest trend in railway signaling, which is High Capacity Signaling, then this is the training for you. The solutions for competency problems are actually on-the-job training. It mirrors what used to happen with apprentices in this country, with cadets in Australia, where people learn from their peers. It was adversely affected during COVID and lockdown when we tried to work virtually and we lost the human interface between people. The conversations used to have around the photocopy or the copy machine when the cadet was doing something, didn't really understand, he could talk to his boss and the problems were solved. Or if the boss realized that things weren't going on in the office, he could go take action and make sure people were on the job properly. The other thing is the question of continuing professional development, which is like the professional institutions of most progressive employers. And I encourage people in quantity Spain who get involved with rail to take an active interest in sort of organizations like the Permanent Way Institution, the Institution of Railway Signaling Engineers, and the Railway Industry Association in the UK and their equivalents around the world, especially when it comes to overhead line electrification. 
because these are extremely technical subjects that you won't get any education out of normal CPD activities that the professional institutions run. Quantity slaying, they're going to concentrate on building, not on engineering. So that that is the way forward. You've got to encourage continuing professional development, and also you've got to invite undergraduates to those schemes as they come through the universities and through trading. Um, then they get the sort of grounding that many of us years ago who embraced the exit of the industry and the professions without the benefit of a university education, but by solid experience. So there we are. That's the way we go. Um, equally, they need to be assessed in the office once the procedures are in, once you've covered the training of the technical competencies, you've got to make sure that good quantity slaying and estimating practices is followed. You create the control documents, the cost control documents, which then become the audit trail for the project as a whole in terms of cost. And in civil engineering role, especially program, because cost equals money. If the cost starts to go wrong, you can carry uh, cost equals money equals time. If the cost starts to go wrong, then the time will go wrong and we start to get contract extensions. So that's the way I would approach it. There are certain things you can't do at a junior level. If you're building a brand new railway, presumably if you were going to build one considers, say, Sydney to Newcastle, New South Wales, which is effectively the same length as HS2 phase one in the UK, you've got the problems like land acquisition and things like that. And those in themselves can have a very adverse effect on project cost and performance if you don't understand the problems of acquiring the land for your railway. Um, <clears throat> it's easy to say they do it in China. China is, with respect, not a democracy. The state can simply say we want the land and they take it and get it. In a democracy like Australia or like the UK or elsewhere in Europe, there are systems of compulsory purchase which have the rights of appeal and adjustment. All of those take time. And also, if you try to do all of these processes too quickly, you'll find you simply, it's not a question of not having the competences to do it, you simply do not have the people capable of managing the processes. Go back to HS2 phase one, they would have needed five compulsory purchase matters to be completed a day for property for 44 weeks of the year, for 10 years, simply to acquire the land for phase one, the way it was set up, it was quite, I don't think anybody really thought about it, but it's that's something that has to be considered at a very senior level, and that's where senior members of the industry can offer added value to clients. You do realise these processes take time. The solution is probably to build projects in smaller parts, in progressive parts, and, bring in, and you can use the smaller parts to overcome the problems of land acquisition and putting projects together, but also to train people. They work together and they improve project by project. Sorry to go back to a UK example. If you look at the electrification of the Southern Railway in the United Kingdom, which is the railway south of London towards the coast, that was electrified progressively between 1912 and 1937 in stages, which meant by the time they got towards the last of the electrification projects, the Brighton Main Line and what have you, they got it down to a fine art. They were delivering very much to cost, very much to time and improving all the while. And there is a lesson to be learned about doing these projects in parts and using them as test beds, training centres for people on them. You must have a training programme in there and people on it have to have open minds because to have worked even in major civil engineering, to come into railways, it is different. Railways are effective this system, far more so than roads, and they need to be integrated. If you don't integrate system, you get problems with cost and time. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, doing smaller steps is probably a good idea in order to afford a smaller uh, team going through a learning curve and then hopefully repeating the same process again and again, but further up on the learning curve. Um, I mean, you, you did mention, if I understood this correctly, you did mention earlier uh, a, a workforce of like 600 or so um, cost estimators or quantity surveyors just for HS2. And I mean, this is, this is a number of, of people, an army of people where oversight becomes very, very difficult, if not impossible. If, if you could do 
the, the same thing with a much lower number of people and you probably can't to the same extent in the same volume but but if you basically turn down the volume that you can uh, afford to do it with a smaller team chances should be that this team can be held more coherent in terms of work quality in terms of continuous improvement in terms of learning for the the next stage of the project where things then supposedly should go better Firstly, and this is what I'm going to say is probably very controversial, you do not need that number of people. 650 people were actually employed by Network Rail, but they're effectively mirrored within HS2 when HS2 took off. So the two, two statistics with HS2, and these are in the public domain, so I'm not breaking any confidences. One particular firm of uh, project managers and quantity slayers has received in excess of £100 million worth of fees out of HS2 for cost estimation and project controls. In the year prior to the Oakham review in 2019, uh, the Oakham review when I was the independent cost advisor, HS2 had spent £11.9 million on quantity slaying cost engineering and could not produce an estimate for the Oakham review. That's a matter of fact, it's in the public domain. Two things. I produced an estimate for HS2, which is the only structured estimate which is in the public domain, and I did it with six people. And you do not need armies of people. If one thinks about railways, it's two beams, the rails on a series of beams, the bearers, going over and under and produce through tunnels, which we've probably been doing since 1825. We can probably do it. You do not need armies of people. What has I, happened yeah. is the big consultants have seen this as an opportunity. They've probably taken advantage of an, an inexperienced client because nobody had built a high-speed railway for many, many years, certainly not since HS1, and that HS1 being the Channel Tunnel Link in the UK, and they certainly hadn't learned from that. And it comes back to this problem of sharing experience, sharing knowledge, both in training of people coming through, but also having a database of costs and project time logs to compare when you look at your next scheme. It's from the from the consultant's point of view it's kind of understandable what happened there uh, even though in my own consulting practice I, I never did anything like that where I basically tried to do unnecessary things in order to maximize the, the consulting fee that I'm, I'm getting I'm just not made like this um, but I I really struggle to understand how poor the the core team on the client side m must have been and and this is not me criticizing anything this is just stating the obvious if things can go out of hand by that much that there is there is no not even as much as common sense left where somebody says well wait a minute yeah if i mean if if uh, i for, for example i i had a bunch of advisors of trusted advisors for certain aspects of the of the project and one of those advisors was well, was on the topic of cost estimates so for example if i if i talked to you and you said you could do an estimate like this with six people and somebody else says i need 10 people i would already start getting suspicious if somebody said i need 300 people i would definitely know that something's absolutely wrong here and I, I I really struggle to understand how it could happen that there was no stopgap, that somebody didn't say, well, wait a minute, time out here, something is horribly wrong and, and we need to sort this out. We can't just keep forking out the money uh, and and not even getting any, any decent results. If you said that this army of cost estimators didn't even manage to produce a cost estimate in the first place, then you were, what are they there for? I just, I, I simply don't get it and I don't understand how anybody else could get that. What's happening there? Well, belatedly, nor does the UK government now. It wonders what it's spent. It's, you know, it's spent between 23 and 29 billion pounds on a railway in the last nine years and hasn't laid a single metre of track. Even the most innocent of politicians think there's something seriously wrong with that. Let's go back to the resources report. I, I'm helped because I've said in the past, 
I am actually a career cost planner, a career analysis, so I've actually produced a cost database of railways. I own a company called the Railway Cost Information Services, which is effectively a database similar to the Building Cost Information Service, which is in the UK and is mirrored by the Australian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, but this is for railway. So I have got a cost database of what railways have cost per single track kilometre, um, per signal, everything else, elsewhere in the world. So I've got a guideline to start off with. I'm not starting from scratch. Several of the people who've come into big schemes like HS2 have actually created their own cost database whilst they've been working. So effectively, the project, the project sponsor has had a de cost engineering development project going on in the middle of his project, which he's paying for. So he's actually effectively, you know, it's almost like the old cynicism about consultancy. A consultant is somebody who borrows your watch and tells you the time. Effectively, all of this is being developed at the ultimate, the project promoter's cost. Now, if there is no work at all like this anywhere in the world, you know, there's no comparables, that's perhaps understandable, but it should be understood from the start. And the fact that there is this absence of cost database and project control database should be made clearly apparent to the promoter. So he or she or they can take the appropriate measures. And there we come back to the roles of the professional institutions. They basically are under very heavy criticism in the UK for not having created standards for this work which has been carried out, not having monitored how those standards, if they did exist, were applied, how people applying them were performing, and what happens to miscreants. You've got to get the professional institutions to basically create the standards, and they have to do it with the promoters, because the one thing about the railway promoters, whether it be the federal government in Australia or New South Wales Railways or Victoria or Western Australia, they have the critical mass of projects to insist that this data is collected on their projects. So effectively, they create the project cost databases, take control of them, which enables them to employ consultants at a reasonable cost and a reasonable number. That's very important. Data, as we know, all the way around the world is power. It's worth a lot of money. A lot of these things have been missed. I go back to my own experience, which I started with. The amount of cost data within rail track network rail since 1993 is tremendous. And I have been fortunate having access to a lot of it to create the cost database. And that is, you know, you've got the cost data experience of very nearly oh, just over 30 years now. There is no reason why you can't do it as HS2 is resurrected in the UK, is taking everything that has been done today, consolidated into a cost database, and if we are going to go again, you start from a basis of knowledge, even if that knowledge is imperfect. Now, that knowledge can also be imported overseas. There's no reason why our experiences with HS2 Phase 1 can't be used on Sydney to Newcastle, New South Wales, high speed rail, adjusted for currencies and market conditions. But it all comes down to the assimilation, accumulation of nature and uh, information and its dissemination amongst the people working on the project. I I'm I'm just digesting the last point that you said. And in in my point of view, there's a major risk to that. Um what we have seen in Australia in the past, and I'm not entirely sure whether that's still a, a Australian British thing or anything like that, that we had uh, consultants coming over from Great Britain to Australia that were welcomed here with open arms on the basis of experience in inverted commas that very often wasn't that much of useful experience anyway. So specifically with regards to uh, high-speed rail, if somebody came over from the UK with the reference of having worked on high-speed too, I myself would not consider this a very promising reference because of the so far pretty poor outcome of, of HS2. But what, what I'm concerned about is that, that uh, people come here selling themselves as having all the experience on high speed, on the back of high speed too. And what they're basically doing is 
selling the same mistakes and the same overpricing of consultancy services that they previously did in the UK as best practice in other countries, for example, here in Australia. And the consequences for the high-speed plans and high-speed concepts here in Australia would be catastrophic because the, the last thing that anyone could wish for here working in the rail industry would be a repeat of high-speed 2 to date but in Australia, that this is this has to be avoided at all costs. And at the moment, I'm really seeing a discrepancy here um, between the seeming credibility of UK consultants and um, yeah, and and the and the actual output, like the stuff that you were you were talking about. So. I'm I'm not quite sure and I can only hope that we have people here in responsible roles with enough common sense to really separate the the wheat from the chaff and and really saying okay well what what is uh experience that's actually beneficial for the project so so without pitching your services but with the cost database that you have and you have um, sole control over getting someone like you on board in some kind of facility related to cost estimating would also provide the access to that database and and that would be a relatively good reference I would think personally to at least look at it and consider it Whereas on the other side, if a consultancy came in here and and uh, basically proposed a team of twenty five people to did to do the work that's normally done by a team of three, justifying it with a lot of additional stuff on top of it that sounds important but is not really essential for the project. That that's basically some kind of bulldust that that hopefully people can can see through. But I'm concerned they're not. Yeah. So, what what would you think? How could a country like Australia that that's just starting to venture in into that high speed rail environment? How can they separate the good experience from the bad experience? first thing is in Australia, if you look in high speed rail, is to clearly define what you want to do with the project, where you're going to start, where you're going to go to, what sections you're going to build into, you know, where do you go in Sydney, where do you go in Newcastle, to eventually be able to go to Melbourne and eventually to go to Brisbane, is to define what you want. If you don't define what you want or what you're trying to achieve, then you lay the foundations for basically cost overruns and consultancy abuse, if that's what you're going to call it, or the, the, the ex, exponential increase in cost, if you haven't defined your scope, I mean, the problems with HS2, which is um, nothing to do with quantum, arguably nothing to do with quantum, as it still isn't going into use, it doesn't go to Manchester, it doesn't go to Leeds, which were the three places it was supposed to serve. So the first thing to learn in Australia is define clearly where you want to go to and what you want to do, what your ultimate plan is. And that has to come from rail operators, Frank. It has to come from people who are going to run the system. You may choose to have a shadow operator with you, which might need 5, 10, 20 people with you, to say this is how we're going to try and run this railway. You define the process. Once you've got that in place, then you've got basically, and I, I, I make no hesitation in saying this, you have fairly simple linear infrastructure. You, you know, the railway is a standard gauge around the world. They're four foot eight and a half, 1,435 metres of gauge. Still the wheel, the distance between the reels of Roman chariots, it's absolutely standard. That's what it is. Uh, track standards are basically the same. So there shouldn't be any great problem in proving cost estimates for linear infrastructure. Going back, if you define the scope, you know the land you want, how you're going to get the land. If you take it in bite-sized chunks and you're building budget in bite-sized chunks, you all learn together, you become a team. Now, just going on to where I come from in this is that 
Yes, I'm very flattered. People say I got HS2 right over cost. A lot of people got HS2 right over cost. I wasn't the only person. I just happened to be the only one who was acting for people petitioning against it. And my voice became heard in public through the people I've worked for and the work I've done with Parliament. So I'm, 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 I'm not the fonds in the reserve of all knowledge. I just happened to be the person who put my head above the parapet and talked about it. What I would like to be able to do, I mean, part talking to you, Frank, is to bring the skills and experience to Australia so I can talk to people about just be careful of some of these issues. If you're going to set these jobs out, these are some of the things you need to understand and how you're going to resource. You also have to be aware of people you appoint. As I said, I mean, one of the great problems is with people coming out of university these days, certainly in Europe, is they come out with fairly heavy student debt, student loans. The housing market, the accommodation markets are very expensive. So they need to get as far up the business ladder as they possibly can, as quickly as they can, to have any sort of personal and social life. The problem of that is, of course, it mitigates or drives against getting the basic experience of what you're trying to do. It's almost as if people um, go for a job not as an apprentice or a cadet quantity swear engineer. They're almost going to a job as a cadet boss or apprentice boss. So you're missing that whole basis of knowledge and experience that most of us got between, say, 18 and 25, 26. So certainly if we look at the projects in Australia, that's what I would like to bring. You know, I'm a member of the Australian Institute of Quantum Surveyors. I would very much like to bring that through in AIQS so that um, people can learn from it and people in all the states around Australia can apply it to works wherever they are. These projects, these problems in the UK can be avoided and will be avoided if people are prepared to take appropriate action. That's creation of the standards to do the work, monitoring the standards, regulating the people who do it, dealing with miscreants. On the operational side, making sure that people's technical education, even post-graduation, is still there. They're talking to people within the industry, you know, permanent way people, signalling people, attraction people, and generally liaising with people like in the UK Chartered Institute of Railway Operators or the Chartered Institute of Listings in Transport, the people who actually run railways. What is this system you're trying to build? How does it work? Generally, you get a universal education as to what you're trying to do. It's all about learning and the willingness to learn. You don't simply sell yourself as the finished article. None of us is the finished article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's true. And, and I mean, I, I had several discussions recently about this whole topic of, of high-speed rail. Uh, you've been a guest yourself at the live event that we did where, where Steve Alday was my main guest. Uh, another attendee, uh, I had a separate podcast conversation with a little bit later on, a guy from Spain who actually happens to be Australian. Uh, and he also was very interested in uh, well, helping the Australian industry to find their feet in that in that high speed market. One thing that I I kept saying time and again, and and nobody could really argue against that, is how important it is to define the scope of that railway, and uh, that it's not enough to just say, ah, oh, well, it's a rail line from Sydney to Newcastle, and you you basically hit it on the head and saying from where in Sydney exactly to where in Newcastle and um, what's the expected corridor? Where is the train to stop in between? So, for example, if I chose, just for argument's sake, a central station in Sydney and a respective central location in Newcastle, maybe where the old railway station is in the, in the center of town, um, whether that's feasible or not, it's a different story altogether. But but choosing those locations would immediately give indicators how the corridor needs to be built. For example, in uh, Sydney Central, there would be absolutely no way to bring a high-speed corridor into that location over ground. You've got to tunnel and you've got to tunnel quite a long way to get out of the uh, inner city of Sydney if you wanted to do that. And uh, if, for example, somebody wanted an intermediate stop in the West, say at places like Parramatta or maybe the new Western Sydney Airport, that obviously would require a very different corridor compared to going straight out to the to the north of uh, of central of Sydney as quickly as you can and and on the on the shortest uh, possible way. 
we and I, I I keep saying that we just had this this horrendous case study from a freight line here in Australia called Inland Rail, where everybody and their dog knew that it was a freight line supposed to go from Melbourne to Brisbane, but nobody exactly knew from where in Melbourne to where in Brisbane. And that's still the case today, as we are already like 10 years or so into the into the project. And then people are surprised or seem surprised that the cost estimates are a complete moving target. They're going up and up and up. And uh, when the recent audit was done, the auditor basically said, oh, what we can establish at the moment, it's more than three times than what it was initially in the initial budget. But the latest estimate, it's not reliable enough to to really say, this is what I think it will be. Because the scope is still not finalized. And, and, and to me, this is really flabbergasting. Um, I mean, there, there always will be minor refinements of the scope as you go along. Yeah, you do some uh, geotechnical investigations and suddenly you realize your tunnel needs to be, I don't know, 50 meters further to the left or something like that. And then you need to have a curve and so on. The tunnel gets longer, stuff like that. But 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 not even knowing the most essential basics for a railway line, which are the correct two endpoints, it it bothers me. It not just astonishes me; it bothers me, and I don't understand with intelligent, highly paid people sitting in the governance for these projects how this cannot be picked up or how this hasn't been picked up for years and years and years. It's it's absolutely beyond me. If I could offer a comment, sir, one of the great problems is these major rallies are publicly promoted these years by central and local government. And in a democracy, certainly, you've got to carry people along the route with you. In a, in a passenger railway, if you want to support people along the route, everybody wants a station within their mm. constituents. It yeah. kills, the, kills the concept of high-speed rail completely. You then... You, you basically you you almost get a railway that looks like a zigzag like the zigzag railway in New South Wales, but a high speed one. Uh, but equally with freight, is you get people, property developers get involved. Everybody wants their freight terminal connected to the railway, which is what I found when I did the the Central Railway PLC in the noughties. You finish up with a, 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 a totally convoluted route, which doesn't make any sense. Unfortunately, you've got to have. Either you have to have a very strong central government with very strong powers of project procurement to put it exactly where they want it, or you have to put it into the private sector. The private sector's attitude towards this is very, very different. They will look at how the operation of it is going to work, what is the best solution, and they will have a far harder approach towards cost and program. And they are not constrained, of course, by or not constrained anywhere near as much, is by political constraints or lobbying constraints of people along the route. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things here, taking on, you know, I appear to be very critical of quantity spares and cost data. One thing that has come out of the HS2 process in the UK is the need to streamline and strengthen the planning consent. It's not just with railways and everything else, railways and roads. In this small country, this small island on which I sit, there is also a major problem with housing. And that is being frustrated because of labyrinthine planning processes so infrastructure generally needs to be streamlined australia you have the luxury of land you have the ability of the central and the federal government the federal governments and the state governments to say this is where we're going to go make a decision and stick to it if you allow i know the inland rail i actually did some work on it many years ago after i did central railway plc and no disrespect to as a visitor to Australia, I don't appear to be disrespectful to the federal and state government. It was almost the classic thing of the horse being designed by a committee. You finish up with a camel. Because everybody wanted it to go everywhere. Nobody could really be decided. Well, everybody wanted it to go everywhere. But equally, a lot of people didn't want it to go anywhere near them. So you finish with the worst of both worlds. You are basically, you're rather like a, a table tennis match. They're being pinged backwards and forwards as to where this goes. You do have in Australia, we do have in Australia, the luxury of land. So you should be able to resolve these problems. The whole point of 
the inland railway is the problems of dealing with the big container ships that go around the world. They just go around the world rather like the hands on a clock. If they touch, an, touch a continent in Australia, whether it be Cairns or whether it be Melbourne, as far as they're concerned, they've touched Australia, they've delivered the goods. You've then got to get them about as quickly as possible. And that's how important it is to get this right. So basically the start and finish points are, should be the most advantageous points at which you can take merchandise off shipping. Yeah. And uh, and from that perspective, it may be surprising to some, but not for all, that Inland Rail is definitely not going to Brisbane Harbour or to the port of Brisbane, which in the area of Brisbane would be the number one port where you would want to be connected to. And again, I'm not criticizing. I'm not saying it's very easy to have that last bit uh, building a, a high capacity freight line into the center of Brisbane in order to go to the port. Uh, nobody said it's easy. But uh, if those things cannot be sorted satisfactorily, then what's the point of the project in the first place? And, um, well, and, and it's a similar thing. I mean... Going away from Australia and back to the UK for for a moment, uh, high speed tool from what I heard from the distance, and I haven't paid too much attention because it seems to be quite a quite a shamozzle. Um, there's an option to go into London Euston, which would be understandable because many other uh, main lines going to the northwest are going into Euston as well. Or there's an option going into Old Oak Common, which is uh, well, quite a bit outside uh, the, the city area of London. Now, whether it's the one option or the other will obviously have a significant effect on, on cost, on uh, deliverability of the project, probably on timelines as well, on land acquisition, and so on and so forth. So, 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 throwing back and forth between those two options without making a call, to me, seems to lack the very basics of the entire project. So, starting a project like this without having a clear decision there. And and by all means, you, you could you could draw a line in the sand and you say, for the time being, we're going to Old Oak Common. We have an option to take it further from Old Oak Common into Houston or whatever other station there is. And we will decide this later on. But for the time being, all the calculations are based on this terminal point. That would make the scope clear, at least for the time being. But leaving the decision open and having some people assuming that the railway has to go into Houston and that's what we're working towards and other people assuming that this is not feasible, it can only go to, to the other place and working on that basis It's like a rowing boat where people are rowing in two different directions. You're not, you're not getting anywhere uh, lest some some person is stronger than the other and then you may have a very slow creeping movement or maybe going back and forth for a while that that seems to be happening and 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 this is really something where which is against the very definition of a project which means delivering a certain defined scope in a defined uh time frame and against a defined budget But how can you define a time frame and a budget when you don't even know exactly and precisely what your what your scope is? It's it's I don't I don't understand it. I don't understand it. And I mean I, I did manage projects myself before, but but I wouldn't claim to be the 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 only person in Australia understanding these things. I, I think everybody listening to that podcast with a little bit of common sense would say, Yeah, of course, if I built a railway line, I need to know the two endpoints. And then I can sort out the stuff in the middle, but without the two endpoints, I basically don't have a line. I don't have a point to point connection when the points are unknown. Well, that's absolutely true. Let, let, let me address the issues, the lessons to be learned in Australia. Firstly, it is problem, It is possible to get to use. It just happens to be that HS2's preferred solution is undeliverable for engineering reasons. And they've known that since October 2016. Now, why that has not been resolved, that's a separate issue. You can get into Euston. 
to just stop an old oak common creates another problem. How do you then get into London? You've effectively got to build a, an interchange station on the Great Western Main Line. Old oak common afterwards was chosen because it was originally the site of the engine sheds for the Great Western Railway. That's why old oak common is where it is. So you've got to build a station on the Great Western Main Line. That's Paddington out to Bristol, out to Cardiff and the West Country. The equivalent of an eight platform station on a live mainline railway. You well imagine what disruption that's going to cause. So it's not really a solution. So the answer is there is a solution into Houston. There is also a solution as to what you could ultimately do at Old Oak Common. And where I'm coming from, having been seen as a critic for the last eight or nine years, is talking to people about how we put this together using some of the techniques we've used that talked about earlier in our conversation using private finance and private management, but defining the project very clearly. We are going to go to Euston. This is the way we go to Euston. And the way you go to Euston is you put the tunnelled access from Old Oak Common in a different position. Decision done. It's cost money, but you've got to make use of what's been done to date. Because the other great problem in the UK is that the railway between Old Oak Common and Birmingham is under construction. It's literally over my right shoulder. It's about three... 10 kilometres behind me, that's the Delta Junction on HS2 is where I'm sitting. You cannot have this thing sit there like a latter-day stone hedge with nothing happening. These structures, for whatever reason, have been put up. We've got to do something with it. So we have to find a solution as to how we get into Houston and what we do with the sudden end of HS2. It can be done, it will be done, but it comes down to the point you make, Frank, is clear decisions made as to what the scope is. We are going to Houston, this is how we're going to go to Houston, and we get on with it. It may not be the optimum cost solution now, but it is the only solution, as I said, if we're going to avoid what is effectively a last day Stonehenge. You know, Michael, what, what really bothers me as well is what you just said, that you were seen as a critic for the last eight or nine years. And, and everything I'm hearing from you is that all you want is come to a solution of the problem. So, 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 and, and it's a similar thing over here at my end. I'm, I'm pretty sure there are many people in Australia at the moment who consider me an opponent of high speed rail in Australia, which couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, I'm from Germany. I'm a huge fan of high speed. I was a very frequent user of high speed rail in Germany because it made sense. So the only thing I'm saying is you can do high speed rail here in Australia all you like as long as it makes sense. And as long as it's planned with common sense, as people are clear about the real cost of the project, about the real time it will take to build, about the real prospects of people using it, not just dreaming stuff up that, that, uh, I don't know, Grandma Anna at age 73 will probably use the new high speed rail at least once a week. For what? Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that, that this is a real example, but, but I, uh, for example, if, if somebody, if somebody says, oh, we should be able to, uh, to get, uh, 70% of the passengers of the current air connection between Sydney and Melbourne. Well, as a target or a vision, fine. But, but then there needs to be a concrete, plausible concept how high speed rail needs to work in order to be able to attract 70% of air passengers onto the railway. And uh, if the rail connection, just for argument's sake, takes twice as long as the, as the flight connection, there, there won't be 70% saying, oh yeah, well, I'm happy to spend another three hours on my daily business trip in either direction which makes my one-day business trip Sydney to Melbourne into a two-day business trip with an overnight stay that I don't want where I can't be with my family. So, so, so this, is, this is the kind of thinking that I'm, that I'm, really, that, that I'm really missing here. I, I mean, I, I've been optimistic all the way that with the creation of the new high-speed rail authority here and with a very intelligent head of this organization, Tim Parker, who used to work for Sydney Metro, um, that this kind of common sense will be introduced and hopefully applied consistently because that's what we need. And based on that common sense, it should be possible to come up with a very clear yes, no statement. Does high speed rail in Australia make sense? And if so, to what extent? Or does it not make sense because we just can't figure out the business case? 
And if you can't figure out an economic case for a project, then the project should not be started. End of story. And as far as I can see, this is what has happened in Australia for high-speed rail for the last 20, 25, 30 years, where we've done feasibility study after feasibility study after feasibility study, and no government ever gave a go for the outcome simply because it was not good enough, it was not attractive enough, it was not reliable enough that the government would say, yep, that will work, and on that basis we are happy to spend the money. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I mean, ba basically, business case preparation sits before cost estimation, but one of the issues that came out of the Oakham Review in the UK was trying to understand how the business case had been put together. And it was extremely cloudy as to what were the benefits of the railway. You can go down to almost the Mr. McCorber type approach. How much is it going to cost to run? What are we going to take in tickets? If basically we our ticket expenditure exceeds our cost of running, then we're happy. It doesn't work that way. With high-speed rail, you've got other things apart from you've got modal shift of transport use, what's going to do. You know, people are off aeroplanes onto the trains, which goes towards the decarbonisation agenda and the sustainability agenda. You also get the opportunities with high-speed rail, irrespective of where you build them, to have major re urban regeneration around photo nodal points, about stations and everything else. You, you, know, you can create new business districts, Look what the Jubilee line did to Canary Docklands in London, created a whole new business district simply by the railway. So that has to come in the wider economic benefits rather than simply the monetary benefits. You also look at the environment, environmental impacts. What does it do in a smaller country like this about taking traffic off the roads, reduces petrol and diesel consumption? What does it do in Australia? Equally, in Australia, with your inland rail project, it takes an awful lot of interstate freight off the roads. And I'm told that, you know, when I last looked at it, that, you know, road traffic accidents with freight operators were quite common there. And it was one way of making road traffic more safe. If basically, you put the freight on the railways. So that's part of the project appraisal process, not just the financial appraisal. What are the wider economic benefits of building a railway? What are the environmental benefits? And the wider economic benefits are several. I mean, basically, you've got the initial one where you're actually training the people. Going back to what we've talked about, training people on the job, you're training people for the future developments. After you've done this project, you'll do another with a, an informed workforce. And that's the, a, an economic benefit whilst it's being built. And then you've got once post, you've then got post completion benefits. What does it do to areas around Newcastle? What would it do to a station around Parramatta, around the new Sydney Air, West Sydney Airport? What would it do to regenerate, to provide homes, jobs, and everything else? That all comes into it because, you know, basically, you know, historically, railway towns have been created by the railways coming, and they've been very, very successful. There's no reason why we can't do it in the 21st century, what we did in the 19th century. We can do it. So the point I'm trying to make is make the decision. Understand mm. infrastructure is expensive. There's no way of it is expensive. But the payback period for infrastructure is a lot longer than your house or your office block you might build. HS2, it was done on the basis of a 60-year whole life cycle cost. It probably should have been done on something longer. If you look at it now, our major railways in the UK were built between 1838 and 1840, and they're still operating, thanks to Robert George and Robert Stevenson, and Isambard Kingdom, Brunel. The payback period for this is a very long period of time. It's probably outside the ordinary person's concept, but we have to have a proper project appraisal process as well as cost estimation process. It's all about learning, and there are huge opportunities to learn from what's happened with HS2 to date. And what will happen with HS2 is that almost certainly it's going to get resurrected and completed, in my opinion. Mm. Mm. It has to be. Yeah, 
I well, I I think I think there is there there seems to be quite strong political will here in Australia to really do something with high speed rail, or, or should I say with faster rail? I mean that that's one of the things that I promoted a lot in the past, where I basically said I see three main pillars for land transport on rail in Australia. One being metro or commuter rails inside the cities that we have inside the big cities, um, then. We have very high speed, which is basically a city to city connection over long distances where Sydney Melbourne is roughly eight, nine hundred kilometers and about the same distance from Sydney to Brisbane. And then in between, we have something which I tend to call regional faster rail, which are connections from the big cities to the nearest regional centers. So Sydney to Newcastle, in my definition, would fit into that category of regional fast rail with the added benefit that it could be a starting point for a long distance high speed connection between Sydney and Brisbane. In the same way, Sydney to Canberra could be seen as regional fast rail uh, and the starting point for a connection from Sydney to Melbourne. Um, so so, so I, I think something will happen there, but the decisions need to be made. Well, they need to be made full stop. So I'm fully with you there. There need to be clear decisions with regards to scope, with regards to the number of stops in between, and also with regards to what are we going to do with the precincts around the stations. And that, that really goes all the way to uh, urban development of places that at the moment may want to get a train station, but they may not want the consequences that such a station development would have for them. So by means of example, um, if I if I take a stop somewhere between Canberra and Melbourne, I just take Wagga Wagga, for example, or you can take Albury, Vodonga, whatever you want, um, in order to make sense from a patronage perspective, you would probably assume that those um urbanities get similar sizes to at least Newcastle, if not more. So so ideally, you want to grow the population in those areas around those stations by at least a factor of two, probably more. Now, what I would assume that, that people who have moved to live in Wagga Wagga over the last like 50 years they moved there to have a regional, uh, 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 like a semi-rural lifestyle with low cost of living compared to the big cities and without traffic jams, with a limited number of shops, which is just good enough for the local community. I would almost bet that most of those people would not want their town to grow to twice the size, which would drive the property prices up and would make housing probably unavo uh, unaffordable or much less affordable than it is today. So, so there may be some local politicians that may probably give their, their right arm or better their right arm of a relative so that it's not their own body uh, to get this kind of growth because it makes them look more important. But the actual population is probably closer to what you would call NIMBY in the in the UK, where you said everybody wants a station, but not in my backyard. Yeah, but build it somewhere else where I got a relatively short commute, but it it not directly here. And everybody says the same thing, and then you don't know where to where to build the bloody thing. So I I don't I don't know I I I'm I'm yet to see, and it's it's not up to me to get to see anything. But 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 I think from a from a taxpayer's perspective. It's it's a valid request to get to see uh, a, an urban planning scheme which looks halfway plausible and credible on which the patronage demand is based. Yeah, and and if and if the basis for this plan is a growth of Wagga Wagga by a factor of two so that it can get a train station and then you have all this urban development which maybe even finance some part of the project cost. What do the people say about that? Right? No, Nobody moves to Wagga Wagga for frequent commutes to Melbourne or Sydney. I can tell you that much. Yeah? So... You live in a big country but basically you're going to have population growth 
Uh, not everyone can live in Sydney or Canberra or Melbourne. They're going to move somewhere else. Uh, and basically, unless you can provide uh, uh, what you can provide the workforce that these cities want, you basically what your railway system do is widening the travel to work areas of these major cities. Whether you like it or not, that's effectively what happens because the better jobs in the bigger cities, the more opportunities certainly for young people who then have an opportunity, if they can live out in the country, they have an, an opportunity to buy or acquire accommodation in which to live, which they couldn't in the big cities. So, so I think that that's part of the wider economic benefits you have to look at. It isn't just the railway itself. Mm. Um, unfortunately... You, you, you know, you always have had problems of nimbyism. If you go back to Charles Dombey, Charles Dickens, Dombey and Son in 1839, he talks about the problems of removing the slums when the London and Birmingham Railway was built into use. So there's nothing new about problems of nimbyism and affected local communities. It, you know, unfortunately, you have to get used to it. That's great. As long as it is done responsibly and it comes down to setting the project parameters, where you want to go and where you're going to go to, are you try and do it with a minimum effect on communities as you go through. Uh, that's why you tunnel. You're not going to go into Melbourne or Brisbane. Brisbane is actually on the surface. You're going to go properly underground or something like that. You've got to think about that. That's part of the process. And that, we're moving away from cost estimation project control, is that's getting politicians to understand what they're promoting. You talk about politicians' involvement. The most dangerous thing I've found is a politician says, we must have a high-speed railway. And you say, why? Because the nearest country to us across the sea or over there has got one, so we must have one. Now, yeah, yeah. It's keeping up with the Joneses, and that's what I've seen very, very often, especially on LinkedIn. Uh, somebody happened to be on holiday in Spain or in Japan, and they they are all fascinated by the high speed services there, which which I can absolutely understand. Yeah, if anybody wants to travel to Germany, they have a very nice high speed system too. So has France, so has Italy, Sweden as well. So, but. Coming back with the conclusion that Australia must have a high-speed railway because it works so well in those other countries, which has a which have a completely different uh, demographic and uh, topography and and distances between cities and size of the cities and everything. It, it's it it's it's difficult. It's difficult, and 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 I think part of a commonsensical approach to that is looking at examples that are really comparable. Yeah. So in a recent podcast episode um, that that will be aired before this one here with you, um, we had a discussion about Spain, and it basically turned out that the connection between uh, Madrid and Barcelona in Spain, the high speed connection, is relatively relevant uh, for comparison with Sydney to Melbourne. Uh, it's it's not quite as far as part as here in Australia, but the, the size of the cities is well the, the Spanish cities are a bit are a bit bigger, but then you say yeah, but the Australian cities will grow. So so it it to me it seemed a more uh, apples to apples comparison than anything else I've seen before. Then something like I don't know Tokyo to Osaka, for example, where the the, the sheer size of your population is outnumbering whatever we have here in Australia, and the distances are shorter and, and whatever. So so picking the right examples and listening to the right experts and be it just to get an independent second opinion to just say, oh wait a minute, I've spoken to three people. The opinions I heard went into three completely different directions. Let's stop for a moment and sort out what the issue is here and which of those three directions is actually the most right. Right? That's that's really what's needed. And um, in in order to um, to end this discussion here on an optimistic note, I really really do hope I can't stress this enough that the High Speed Rail Authority will bring this kind of, of rigor and this kind of common sense into the discussion and bring the whole thing to a conclusion that will be trusted by the government. And it's not just a remit of um, whatever you do, justify high speed at all cost. That, that would be 
a very a very poor outcome and a very poor approach and I I hope very much that this is not the case. Yeah, Sydney to Newcastle to me is regional fast rail. Sydney to Canberra the same. Uh, there will be connections to regional centers around Melbourne, around Brisbane as well. The connections to the Gold Coast, to the Sunshine Coast in Brisbane would fit into that category, and you could probably achieve the majority of the benefits and the majority of the ridership at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the risk. And uh, so then the only thing left is really a point-to-point -point connection, Sydney to Melbourne and Sydney to Brisbane, uh, where you need to compare uh, yourself with, with air travel and then basically asking the question, is it is it worth it or, or not? Yeah. True. I'd agree with you. I mean, you've got to make decisions as simple as that. Yeah. Um, I, in Australia, I would strongly advise Sydney to Newcastle, New South Wales to be used as a prototype, so it's a learning curve. We can do all the things we've talked about, and we develop from there. You've got to make mistakes along the way. Everybody makes mistakes, but you don't want to make a major mistake, get the whole project wrong at one go. Um, no, it, they, these problems can be solved. Providing you've got all the parameters in place, wider economic benefits, environmental impacts, as well as cost and transfer, modal transfer of, of usage of, you know, of the commuters. Um, there's a great deal to be learned from what's happening in the UK. UK will get it right. It will finish it in the end. We built the first railways, arguably, originally. We gave them to the world. Perhaps we're going to do it again with high speed. Who knows? But no, there is a... There are some positive things to be taken from my experience. I'd certainly like to share them in Australia. Um, I'm sharing them in the Middle East with the GCC rail process, which Etihad Rail are putting through. Again, let's learn from it and go forward. We have to share and work together. Exactly. On that very note, thank you very much, Michael, for your time. I I hope that, that people noted that you've got a lot of experience in that field and uh, that you're happy to share that experience with uh, with people in in Australia. And uh, I would actually welcome if if anybody with real uh, material to contribute would be allowed to contribute here in Australia. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me, Frank. Really enjoyed it. Good. Thanks. The interoperability of digital signaling systems is not just an issue here in Australia, but also in other countries that have several radio systems interoperating with each other. Therefore, I have created the best and probably only training in the world on the topic of digital signaling interoperability. It includes my trademark SPA framework. If you want to know what that means, just have a listen to the training. I talk about digital signaling in Australia, which is transferable to other countries as well. I introduce the main technologies CBTC, ETCS, and also ATMS, which is a special bespoke Australian development. I talk about the hierarchy of interoperability controls, which is extremely helpful in investigating what can be done regarding interoperability. I talk about interoperability between different CBTC systems, interoperability between ETCS, which is not as easy as it may seem, and also interoperability between different signaling technologies. Podcast listeners are currently getting a special 10% discount if they sign up before the 30th of June 2024. And the link to sign up is docfranktraining.podia.com slash interoperability. I say it again, it's docfranktraining.podia.com slash interoperability. Hi, it's Doc Frank again. I hope you liked today's episode. I like to keep it as simple as possible, so I only have one single request for you. If you like this podcast, please tell your friends and colleagues about it. That's all I want because that's a service that I'm providing to the industry and I would like as many people as possible 
to listen to this podcast and learn something from it. So please share. And until next time, keep it simple and bye for now. Thank you for listening.